the title of my presentation today is It's a Movement, um, looking at the update on the management of tardive dyskinesia. So I have uh, no disclosures, nobody's paying me money. Um, if anybody wants to offer money, I'll take it, but at this point, I've got nothing to disclose there. Um, we will be discussing some off-label use of um, ginkgo, vitamin E, clonazepam, and amantadine for tardive dyskinesia. So the objectives for today, uh, become familiar with some of the screening tools uh, to identify TD in patients who are prescribed medications associated with increased risk, uh, assess, uh, assess the safety and efficacy of pharmacological treatments for tardive, and then use evidence-based strategies to manage uh, tardive dyskinesia. Okay, so just a, a quick introduction here. So the de definition of tardive dyskinesia uh, can be easily derived by just breaking the two words apart. Um, tardive simply means late onset of symptoms, and dyskinesia, abnormality or impairment in voluntary movements. Uh, they're caused by dopamine antagonists, uh, most commonly antipsychotics, but uh, also medications like metoclopramide. Um, often manifest as involuntary, purposeless, repetitive uh, movements uh, involving the lips, jaw, tongue, um, more commonly. Also, the upper regions of the face, neck, trunk, upper and lower extremities. You can have some respiratory involvement, making it difficult to swallow, difficult to eat. And there's actually a, a meta-analysis, so um, we know it's correlated with a decreased quality of life, um, but they also showed that it was in, uh, associated with an increased uh, although, albeit uh, weak association, but uh, associated with mortality. So, there was a meta-analysis done in 2017 uh, looking at some more recent times from 2000 to 2015 when the second generation agents became more prevalent. So, one of the longer running theories was that second generations really didn't carry much of a risk for tardive dyskinesia at all. It was minuscule. Um, and what this meta-analysis found, which looked at 41 different studies, a little over 11,000 patients, average age of 43, about two-thirds male, and 77% uh, on the schizophrenia spectrum, that the overall TD prevalence was 25.3%. For those patients on second-generation agents, it was 20.7% compared to first generations, which was 30%. It was uh, significant, so it does have less, but I think that's a lot higher than a lot of people had kind of thought uh, when these medications came to market. Um, of note, patients who had only been on a second generation and no prior treatment with a first generation agent, that risk was 7.2%. So it does decrease, again, quite significantly, but 7.2% um, is certainly very real. So some of the risk factors associated with it, um, antipsychotic use as well as medical bromide, um, Again, antipsychotics have become much more widely used. So we're looking at a wide variety of indications, uh, PTSD, uh, bipolar, sleep, conduct disorder in children. So it's something that, uh, you know, depression, we're just finding a lot of reasons to kind of fit these medications into our treatment plans. And with that, they're becoming more ubiquitous. Um, but the risk factors associated with their use in particular, um, how long they're used, Right? Generally speaking, they should be on it for at least three months and generally more sensitive for the elderly. Um, higher doses, and then also, as we mentioned before, treatment with a first-generation agent. Anticholinergic medications also increase the risk. Um, and so anticholinergic medications may help cover up the symptoms, most of the time make it worse. And covering up the symptoms doesn't mean that we're all of a sudden, even if it does work for that particular reason, minimize the risk of TD. Uh, the presence of EPS early on in the treatment course uh, has been shown to be associated with higher risk of developing TD later on. Elderly patients um, looking at ages 55 and older, the African American race, females, and then patients with substance abuse, uh, primarily alcohol and cocaine, uh, more sensitive there. So there's a lot of different theories for the pathophysiology of tardive dyskinesia. Um, there's no consensus on uh, which one it is. Um, it's probably a little bit of all of them, and they all do have some flaws in them. One of the theories is that with the prolonged use of antipsychotics or dopamine antagonists, you get dopamine hypersensitivity by upregulation of the dopamine receptors. And so when you, dopamine is finally put into the synaptic cleft, that dopamine receptor is hypersensitive and causes those herky-jerky uh, impulsive movements. 
Uh, there's also theories dealing with striatal GABA and cholinergic neurons. Uh, again, these are, both can lead to uh, postsynaptic release of uh, dopamine as well. Uh, increased striatal glutamate, uh, excitotoxicity, uh, oxidative stress obviously can cause damage to these neurons as well. And there is a genetic component. Um, most of the genetic studies have had somewhat moderate effects. Um, the heparin sulfate proteoglycan 2 uh, probably has one of the stronger responses. But um, So not to go super deep in the genetics here, but we can see here um, the D2 and D3 receptor genes as well as the serotonin 2A and 2C. These are all receptors associated with um, the antipsychotics, especially the second generations. Uh, some of the others that have been uh, associated, CYP2D6. Uh, so that's definitely one of the bigger tar targets of pharmacogenomics. So with 2D6, uh, you have a really large variance uh, among our patient population, uh, sometimes as much as 40 times the activity uh, from the lower responders to the higher metabolizers. Now, patients who are on the lower end are going to have higher exposures to the medication, higher doses, and therefore uh, higher risk for TD. Uh, VMAT2, um, vesicular monoamine transporter, we'll definitely touch on that more later as that's the target of some of our uh, newer medications. Uh, manganese superoxide uh, dismutase um, that is involved with antioxidant activity. And so again, um, free radicals can cause damage to some of the neurons. Then the heparin sulfate proteoglycan 2, uh, that is responsible for making uh, a component of the blood-brain barrier. And so if you have a, a difference there, obviously you can have some um, issues with uh, controlling uh, neuronal damage there. Okay, so some clinical considerations before kind of diving into it. Um, there's a lot of patients with TD who are not aware of it. Um, there's a, a single study, it was done in Asia, so take it for what it's worth, but there's a little over, I think, 300 patients, and about 67% of the patients who are in the inpatient setting had TD, not aware. Um, not saying it's that high here, but there's certainly a lot of patients who just aren't aware of it. And so if you have you know, family members that can help with uh, the diagnosis of that as well, and obviously if you're suspecting it. Um, EPS resulting from antipsychotics can contribute to poor adherence and really negatively impacting the relationship we have with our patients. So if we're not fully explaining the risk associated with these, um, both short-term, long-term, and giving the patient the, the choice to figure out basically what's important to them. You know, some patients say, you know, if I gain a single pound, that's the end of the world, right? Don't put me on medication that can cause weight gain. Some patients may not feel just as wrong about um, some of these movement disorders because there's a stigma associated with taking the medications, and now it's obvious to everybody that they are on an antipsychotic or something along those lines. Okay, so this recommended uh, screening schedule for TD is from uh, the APA. And essentially, after initiating a dopamine antagonist, uh, baseline every six months for those taking a first generation, and baseline every 12 months for taking a second generation. And again, it could be a little bit more uh, aggressive with older patients um, every three months. So the diagnostic considerations for tardive dyskinesia, um, it can get uh, a little bit sticky at times. Oral movements uh, related to denture, denture issues is one of them, again, especially in older patients. So if you have a patient who has dentures that don't fit well and they have those oral buccal movements that are similar to TD, you could mistakenly diagnose them with TD. Conversely, if they do have TD, it may make it harder for the dentures to fit, and therefore it could be basically chicken or the egg, which one is it? Um, Drug-induced Parkinsonism is certainly... Uh, commonly confused with TD, um, TD being more arrhythmic, whereas Parkinsonism, you have more of that rhythmic tremor. But you can also help differentiate it by drug response as well. So if you increase the dose of an antipsychotic, in the short term, tardive dyskinesia gets better, right? Because again, one of the theories is being dopamine hypersensitivity. So if you have more dopamine blockade agent, generally gets better. Um, and for a while, they actually used some Haldol and tried to increase the dose to mask the symptoms, but we know chronically it does get worse. Parkinsonism, we know, gets worse with uh, increased dopamine blockade, and vice versa if you decrease the dose. Anticholinergics are another way to tell. Generally speaking, tardive dyskinesia gets worse 
with anticholinergic medications, whereas it can help treat uh, Parkinsonism. You also want to differentiate between withdrawal dys dyskinesia. Um, you usually have symptoms within days to weeks, but it may take two to three months to actually tell once you've actually tapered and discontinued the medication. And so if they're still having tardive symptoms after coming off the medication, that's when we need to think, okay, maybe this patient got TD from that med. And then also just considering that the nature and the severity of the movements um, over time and how they vary. So patients may choose to minimize their symptoms or mask them, and they can do so if they're actually thinking about it. But providing a cognitive or motor distractor, having them touch their fingers or count ABC um, can really help kind of open up some of those movements that they may have. Stress is a big one too. Stress makes these movements worse. And so if someone comes in and says, you know, my wife just left me or you know, my parents passed away or some sort of significant psychosocial stressor, take that to account if their movements are getting worse. Um, and a big thing that I, I think um, some people may not be aware of is that TD disappears during sleep. So one of my favorite things to see, and with a little bit of sarcasm there, is that benztropine 0 0.5, one milligram QHS for tardive dyskinesia. If it is solely tardive dyskinesia, they should not have movements during sleep. If they do have movement during sleep, it may be something else plus TD, but it is not solely TD. Okay, and so I'll kind of go over the, the AIM scale, the abnormal involuntary movement scale here pretty briefly. Um, some of you might be somewhat familiar with it, but it's a 12 item scale, um, originally developed for research. Um, generally takes five, 10 minutes to do uh, in a clinic setting. The first seven items are looking at different movements, oral, facial, extremity, truncal. Items eight to 10 are more of an assessment of global severity. And then 11 and 12 are looking at teeth and dentures. Um, it's generally the most commonly used scale. For those people who do work at the VA, we do have a clinical reminder in CPRS that automatically populates when you're on an antipsychotic. And the AIMS by itself is not diagnostic. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but just looking at uh, the aims here, we can see the first four items are for facial and oral movements. Um, the severity is ranked on a scale of zero to four, zero being no symptoms at all, four being zero, very severe. What I may deem severe, you may deem moderate or minimal. The importance isn't who's right or wrong, because I am right, um, but it's more important to stay consistent with your scoring system, right? So if you call something severe, stick with that. Um, whereas, you know, they come in next time and they go, oh, they have the same presentation, but it doesn't look as bad today. That's when this is going to become less reliable. Um, I not only have the first six items up here, but the first seven is generally considered um, the dyskinesia score, and that's usually the primary outcome in a lot of our uh, tardive dyskinesia studies. Uh, moving on to the, the global judgment, so eight, that's simply just whatever the worst item was on items one through seven, right, whatever the most severe of those scores were, you match that to number eight. Number nine, uh, looking at the incapacitation uh, due to abnormal movements, um, through your assessment, asking the patient, how much does this affect your ability to get dressed every day, eat, um, just basic normal day movements? Um, and how aware is the patient of it? And just creating their awareness on that, and again, Items 11 and 12 are based on denture status, whether they have any sort of current problems with their teeth or dentures, and whether they usually wear dentures. So here's a proposed uh, diagnostic criteria for tardive dyskinesia, probably the most commonly one used. Um, it's a school or cane criteria. And with this is yeah, a minimum of three months on antipsychotic treatment or medical opramide, um, the presence of at least one moderate abnormal movement in at least one body area, or mild movement in at least two body areas and measured by the aims, and then the absence of contributing factors or conditions. Okay, moving on to the uh, treatment of tardive dyskinesia. So traditional treatment strategies, um, you know, we, we have some of the newer medications which came out around 2017, but beforehand we really were like limited in the options we had. Um, we could reduce the dose or discontinue the offending agent if it was appropriate. But again, even beforehand, it was a lot of times being used for schizophrenia and things of that nature, not always the case today. Um, switch to a lower risk medication, which we now have options to do, and discontinue uh, anticholinergic medications. We mentioned before that it generally makes it worse, um, but not only that, but you have the other side effects that are 
accompanied with anticholinergic medications, constipation, cognitive impairment, things of that nature. So one of the strategies is switching to a second generation antipsychotic. Um, there's been a few studies on this. Um, it's not really a vast amount of literature uh, among these agents, risperidone's one of them. Um, I have the, the level of evidence here for each agent listed, and that's from the American Academy of Neurology, uh, being with B being probably effective, C possibly effective, and U being insufficient evidence. So starting with uh, risperidone, um, again a few trials, but I, I picked out uh, one of the stronger ones here. So a 12-week double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial looking at 42 patients, and they were able to show that there was an AIMS reduction of 5.5 points compared to 1.1 placebo, and that was uh, significant. That being said, from a pharmacological standpoint, or a pharmacodynamic standpoint, it's the most potent D2 blockade agent of the second generation agents. Um, and again, this is over 12 weeks, and we know that as we increase dopamine blockade, we can decrease tardive symptoms in the short term and likely make it worse in the long term. Uh, there was another study with olanzapine. Um, they basically showed that 70% of the patients no longer met the um, research diagnostic criteria for TD after eight months of treatment. Um, they also had some reduction in AIM scores as well. And there was actually a study looking at risperidone and olanzapine head to head. And uh, that was a 24 week study. And both were able to show uh, separation from placebo. And risperidone actually had a larger decrease in the AIM score, although it wasn't significant. Um, it was somewhat surprising that it did have a better result over a 24 week period. Um, from a pharmacodynamic standpoint, clozapine and quetiapine do make quite a bit of sense. Um, they have very weak D2 um, occupancy. Quetiapine itself is a, has that kiss and run dynamic with the, uh, where it dissociates very quickly from D2 and doesn't hang on to it. Um, clozapine has uh, more D1 antagonism, which is uh, thought to play a big role in its uh, mechanism of action. But only clozapine really has evidence, and it's pretty limited, definitely smaller studies, lack of randomized controlled trials. Um, but what they did find is that they found more improvement with patients who were, had moderate to severe TD, not as much with mild. So that being said, um, even though there's more evidence per se for risperidone and olanzapine, um, they're still not recommended by uh, the American Academy of Neurology um, due to the propensity to mass symptoms, Parkinsonism, and essentially worsening TD long term. So prior to the new VMAT2 inhibitors, um, we did have a few options available to us. There's four medications that had either a level B or a level C evidence, three of them listed here. The fourth one was tetrabenazine, and we'll, we'll definitely touch on that a little bit since it's similar to the newer agents. Um, and we'll also touch on uh, some of the literature from ginkgo as well as amantadine. Uh, clonazepam um, has really shown to have the most evidence of the benzodiazepines. They've also been studied uh, alprazolam, Valium, um, and they really did not have as good of an impact as clonazepam. Um, with clonazepam, obviously you have your long-term risk. Um, is shown to really help with uh, more of the, the oral facial movements. Um, but essentially, the evidence suggests that basically those effects wean off over somewhere between five and eight months. So using that as a long-term solution uh, really isn't supported by evidence. And then vitamin E, um, there's some evidence supporting that it may help uh, minimize the course of TD, but not necessarily approve it. So some other options here, we can see here in, in the right-hand column, they're all level U, um, so pretty low levels of evidence. Among these, um, Botox probably has some of the uh, stronger evidence. It blocks acetylcholine release, and it's more so for localized TD, obviously, and um, more so used for oral facial. Um, so nisamide has some pretty weak data, but it, it was um, positive. Same with uh, Keppra. And then pyridoxine and uh, melatonin, both as antioxidants, helping preserve uh, some of that neuronal function. Um, some relatively weak evidence there, uh, but does kind of fit in with that theory as well. And they're generally pretty benign um, in terms of their tolerability and side effects. Okay, so touching on ginkgo, um, so EGB761, that's the extract of ginkgo biloba. Um, 
So this study that I'm going to talk about, it was categorized as a class one study. And the most recent guidelines uh, saying it's a very strong structure. It was a 12-week randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial with a six-month follow-up evaluation. Uh, it was done in China looking at schizophrenic patients with TD. Uh, there was 78 patients on ginkgo, 79 on placebo. Uh, males only between ages 18 to 60 uh, who meet the school or cane criteria for TD. There was a one-week placebo run-in and then 12 weeks of double-blind treatment. The dose of ginkgo is 80 milligrams three times a day, and that's the dose that they found to be safe uh, for the dementia studies that they did with it. Uh, the primary outcome being the change in AIMS score, and then they defined a response as at least a 30% reduction in the AIMS total score. So the results here, we can see that um, between the placebo and the uh, ginkgo arms, that uh, the baseline was pretty similar. After six weeks, we had a little bit more of a one-point reduction in the AIM score with ginkgo, and then a little bit more in two points after uh, 12 weeks. And this was statistically significant effect size of uh, 0.769. And in terms of AIMS response, we had a 51.3% of patients had at least a 30% improvement in their AIM score compared to just 5.1 for placebo. Um, so with this, generally pretty well tolerated. That being said, it does increase bleed risk. So for patients who are on um, any sort of antiplatelet medications or anticoagulants, definitely something to keep note of. Okay, uh, amantadine. Um, this is a weaker trial, class three, uh, but it was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover trial. So you had one arm did uh, amantadine, amantadine versus placebo for two weeks, a four-day washout, and then they switched arms. Um, the amantadine dose was 100 milligrams per day, primary outcome being the change in the AIM score. And what they found was a 22% reduction in a total AIM score with amantadine versus zero with placebo. Um, and if you look at the, the subscores here, um, not just the AIM total, but the facial, oral, um, extremity, and AIM severity, they're all statistically significant. And it, it was a pretty short trial, um, given it was only essentially four weeks, two weeks with treatment. Um, so to have that kind of response relatively quickly uh, was notable, but there really haven't been any other studies to, that have been strong to help support its use. Okay, so moving on to VMAT2 inhibitors. Um, so tetrabenazine, that's our older medication, then we have two newer ones, dutetrabenazine and valbenazine. So VMAT2 inhibitors and how they work. So uh, if you look at this diagram here, VMAT2, it's a protein that essentially allows for the transport of dopamine into the uh, synaptic vesicle. If you inhibit that, you don't load the vesicle with dopamine, and when it fuses with a presynaptic membrane, uh, it decreases the amount of dopamine in the synaptic cleft. Therefore, if you, it goes along with the uh, dopamine hypersensitivity theory that if these truly are hypersensitive, that decrease in dopamine helps. So tetrabenazine, this was an orphan drug for chloroform movements of Huntington's disease. It has level C evidence for the treatment of TD. Um, that being said, it's really not recommended uh, due to some of the limitations we have, and more notably because we have agents that have a, a better safety profile. Um, but it has shown efficacy in two class three studies and one class four long-term observational study. Um, really, the, the big difference here is that there's some significant side effects, um, treatment emergent depression and suicidality. Uh, that was obviously a, a pretty big one. Those are black box warnings. Sedation, Parkinsonism, again, as you're treating TD, you may make Parkinsonism worse or present. Um, two of the four metabolites of tetrabenazine are D2 antagonists. So this is especially of note for schizophrenic patients. Um, it has a really short half-life. And so essentially, when you're looking at a half-life of a medication, um, the longer it is, the more steady its concentrations are going to be. It's going to take a little bit longer to get to steady state. But once you are there, you're going to have less waxing and waning in terms of the drug concentration. And so with this one, you're taking it three times a day, and it's still, the concentration is going up and down pretty heavily throughout the day. And then it is metabolized by 2D6. And as I mentioned before, um, with 2D6 metabolism, it can vary a lot amongst our patients. Um, I know pharmacogenomic testing isn't that common in practice. Um, but if we were to prescribe this medication, it is required for doses exceeding uh, 50 milligrams per day. And it's actually recommended with dutetrabenazine as well. 
Um, here's just a quick look at the metabolites of tetrabenazine and therefore do tetrabenazine. I'll talk about the association there, but consider them the same for this slide's purpose and how it compares with valbenazine. So you can see that they share one metabolite, um, but valbenazine only has two metabolites, whereas tetrabenazine and do tetrabenazine have uh, four different metabolites. And two of those metabolites, as I mentioned, for tetrabenazine do have dopamine antagonist uh, activity and therefore just make it more complex in terms of its tolerability and plus with the pharmacokinetics associated with it. So with pharmacokinetics being a big emphasis on why tetrabenazine isn't a great option for us, um, we have do tetrabenazine. Um, so deuterated compounds are definitely a big emphasis in um, pharmaceutical research because we get new patents, we get more money, um, and it's already been shown to work. Um, the idea behind deuterium is that if you can incorporate into a site that is primarily associated with its metabolism, a carbon deuterium bond is stronger than a carbon hydrogen bond. Uh, from a mechanistic standpoint, it doesn't make any difference in terms of its activity. It just makes it harder to metabolize, therefore longer half-lives, less wax and waning. Um, and with this drug in particular, it's been shown to have a greater than two-fold increase in AUC, which is area under the curve. So if you look at the uh, concentration of a medication um, throughout time, it's basically the area underneath that graph. Um, just think of it as total exposure to the medication. Um, and with that, there's only a small increase in the Cmax, which is good, which is the maximum concentration, uh, noting that basically usually you have more of your dose-dependent side effects when you have higher maximum concentrations, and essentially uh, double the half-life. And so it's indicated with a career with, associated with Huntington's disease as well as tardive dyskinesia in adults. Uh, it's dosed initially at six milligrams twice a day for TD with food, and then increased by six milligrams per week uh, to a total max dose of 48 milligrams per day with food. Uh, so I'm gonna go more into the clinical trials here and um, get a little more insight into how efficacious it can be, um, how it compares to some of the other trials that we have, and take it from there. Um, so we have three main sets of trials here with dutetrabenazine. Um, the first couple being the ARM-TD studies, uh, phase two and phase three. Uh, these are 12-week, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials. Um, there's a six-week titration plus six weeks of maintenance with a max dose of 48 milligrams per day, uh, split over BID dosing, with a primary outcome looking at change in AIM score. Uh, the AIM-TD study was a dose-finding study. So basically they took um, the placebo, 12 milligrams per day, which is 6 BID, 24 per day or 36 per day, randomized them in a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one fashion and see how those patients fared against each other. Um, and again, same primary outcome change in name score. There's also a RIM-TD study, um, open label. Uh, and what I initially saw was supposed to be a 158-week study. Um, I did see some results posted 106 weeks. I don't know if they stopped it. Um, but one small thing of note is that um, at that 106 week marker, the scores actually started to get a little bit worse um, from their previous data. And I wonder if they just cut it off because they realized that the data might be no longer supporting its really long term use. I'm speculating, so take it for what it's worth. Okay, so looking at the first trial, the, the ARM TD uh, results. So if you notice here and kind of think back to some of the other studies that we talked about with ginkgo and amantadine, um, the placebo responses were really low. And here, a uh, placebo response of 1.6 is uh, pretty significant. Um, with that being said, um, there, there was significant difference between do tetrabenazine and placebo. Um, and again, this was a titration study, so it's not necessarily for a particular dose. And then keep in mind here, um, as we move on to valbenazine later on, that these were 12-week trials, and part of that because it takes more time to, to titrate up to the uh, most effective dose. The AMTD results, this is a dose-finding result, so you had patients on either the 12 milligrams per day, 24 milligrams per day, or 36 milligrams per day. The 12 milligram per day dosing, if you look here um, at the top, uh, did not separate from placebo whereas the 24 milligrams and 36 milligrams were able to separate from placebo, both having p-values uh, p less than 0 0.05. Uh, 
um, 0 0.003 and 0 001 respectively. So in terms of its uh, adverse events and kind of pooling some of the data, um, there was similar overall results in terms of tolerability between dutetrabenazine and placebo. Um, the ARM-TD study had a little bit more somnolence uh, as well as insomnia, akathisia uh, compared to placebo. They had low rates of psychiatric adverse events. It was not statistically significant, um, different from placebo, and there was no work, a worsening of Parkinsonism during that 12-week study. The AMTD uh, had a little bit more diarrhea, nasopharyngitis, and fatigue um, compared to placebo. There was no difference in psychiatric adverse events, and there was a higher rate of some of the central nervous um, adverse events, like uh, headaches and whatnot, at the higher doses uh, versus some of the other doses um, or placebo. So this here is kind of pulling together some of that data. And there's just a few things I want to kind of um, point your eyes to. Um, I had some nice little graphics here to kind of focus on certain things. But we'll, uh, anyway, okay, so this AMTD, 6 milligrams BID, you can see here that it was 13.3% of the patients had an AIMS response, which was defined as 50% improvement. If you remember the Ginkgo study, we were talking about 30% improvement as a, a minimum. Um, but the number needed to treat here is 80. So I don't know about you. I mean, these drugs are super, super expensive. I'm not going to be treating 80 patients to get the one that works on this 6 milligram BID dose. However, as we increase the dosing um, between 12 and 18 milligrams BID, we had a number needed to treat closer to five point, uh, closer in the range of five, and a AIMS response in the about a third of patients, 34.7, 32.7, 33.7, and then pooling the results over here, excluding the six milligrams BID. Again, looking at 30% AIMS response, number needed to treat of seven, so somewhere between five and seven. Um, we have the, the clinician global response over here. Um, again, with the uh, more adequate doses, number needed to treat between five and eight. Um, the patient uh, global response, a little bit lower somewhere around between 8 to 12, um, pooled at 9. And then looking at um, basically patients discontinuing due to adverse effects. Um, this can get a little confusing because we have some large numbers here for needed to harm and needed to treat. But a negative value for needed to harm means that the placebo was more harmful than the drug. And we got that case with the pooled results here. Um, and then even with the other ones, we had a, a pretty high number needed to harm. So basically, um, almost as uh, equal to placebo in terms of patients who discontinued treatment because they weren't able to tolerate it. So some of the practical issues with uh, dutetrabenazine. Um, so again, we're starting at 6 milligrams uh, twice a day. It's taken with food, going up by 6 milligrams per week um, with a max dose of 24 milligrams BID. And then uh, for those that we have genetic testing for, um, 18 milligrams BID is the max if they're uh, considered poor 2D6 metabolizers. And we're avoiding uh, using this with hepatic impairment, uh, just because we didn't have the data to look at it. It does have risk for QTC prolongation. Um, so making sure that their QTC isn't above 450 for men, um, 470 for females, and also looking to see if there's any sort of drug interactions that can make that uh, potentially worse, um, whether it be a SIP interaction that uh, minimizes its metabolism or another drug that also causes QTC prolongation. Um, so the depression and suicidality is definitely a controversial uh, aspect to some of these studies. So the suicidality, the warning exists with patients with Huntington's disease only. The new studies did, have not found that. Even the 106-week study didn't find that it had the suicidality warning. Um, so it's possible it's only related to those patients. However, we're talking about suicidality. And all these patients are very chronically mentally ill. and so. Um, with something as drastic as suicide, um, there is risk taken with it or caution taken with it. Um, but the data doesn't support the fact that these medications increase the risk for suicide and the treatment of tardive dyskinesia. And again, some, uh, the adverse effects were definitely different between the two studies as well. So for the Huntington's disease patients, uh, again, more somnolence, diarrhea, dry mouth, fatigue, whereas the TD studies, you had more insomnia than somnolence, although it was also present in nasopharyngitis. Uh, moving on to valbenazine. Um, so valbenazine is a highly selective VMAT2 inhibitor. 
And so from a pharmacodynamic standpoint, what receptors it goes after, it doesn't have as many potential adverse effects as some of the other treatments because it's more selective for PMAT2. Um, it's indicated for adults with tardive dyskinesia. It was never studied since it's a new drug for Huntington's disease. Um, and pharmacokinetically, so it's a prodrug, which means that as we take it, it's inactive, we metabolize it, it becomes active, and there's two different active metabolites, as I showed on the slide before, um, one of those being shared with tetrabenazine and dutetrabenazine. Um, a longer half-life, even than dutetrabenazine, allows for once daily dosing. Um, definitely a big perk to that as well, uh, somewhere between 15 to 22 hours. And generally speaking, lower pharmacokinetic intra and intra patient variability. Um, so basically within the, uh, our different patients, it's not going to have, whereas with the 2D6 metabolism and tetrabenazine and dutetrabenazine and how someone can metabolize it 40 times faster, we don't have that same issue with valbenazine, or at least to the same, near, anywhere near the same degree. And it does have a, generally speaking, favorable safety profile. So we're going to touch on a few of the studies here, um, more so um, looking at the Connect 3 and, and some Connect 2. Um, but that was their, their name for the trial, so CONNECT 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, CONNECT 2 was a six-week double, uh, double blind randomized placebo-controlled dose titration study looking between 25 and 75 milligrams. Um, they looked at psychiatric stability analysis to look for suicidality. And then um, some of the outcomes were the change in AIMS, um, the clinical global impression scale um, for tardive dyskinesia, and then the patient global impression scale. For CONNECT3, um, six-week double-blind randomized placebo-controlled, um, looking at doses of 40 milligrams and 80 milligrams. And then they also had an extension study that was 52 weeks long, um, and that was open-label from this CONNECT3 study. And again, the similar outcomes, AIMS, um, CGI, and uh, patient global impression scale as well. Okay, so looking at data from the CONNECT3 score, Again, looking at doses of 40 milligrams per day and, and 80. Um, definitely, both of them were able to separate from placebo relatively pretty quick at week two. Um, it took a little bit longer to do tetrabenazine, but again, a little bit harder to, to titrate that. Um, but even with that being said, there still was more response with the uh, 80 milligram dose versus the 40. If you look at the extension study here, so Right here is the end of the double-blind uh, trial there, and then from there forward is the extension study. So, um, and they're basically allowed to randomize there. So we have the, the 40 milligram arm here, the 80 milligram arm here. Um, and we can see it's basically able to maintain that effect. Of note, so at the end of the extension study, the patients went through a washout period, and we essentially lost almost all the results we had in four weeks. So it's not something we can take it and it's not curative. Um, it's something that would need to be maintained in order to be effective. And again, we're looking at a three point decrease with the 40 milligram arm and a 4.8 uh, decrease in the AIM score for the 80 milligram arm and both were very statistically significant. Okay, so looking at some of the um, safety concerns, adverse events, um, and pulling some of the data here. So from the Connect 3, um, more common to have somnolence, 5.3% versus 3.9% uh, with placebo, a little more akathisia, um, as well as dry mouth. And suicidal ideation was actually lower, although present, with valbenazine compared to placebo, 2.6% versus 5.3%. Uh, the extension study um, had more headaches, um, UTIs, interesting enough. There's no difference in suicidal ideation, so they're both equal at 5%. Um, and generally speaking, between the doses, there wasn't any overall differences in terms of adverse effects between the 40 and 80 milligrams. However, you did have higher rates of diarrhea and dizziness with the 80 milligrams compared to 40. Um, and there's just some patients who really can't tolerate the 80, and even though we know it's generally supposed to be more effective, um, 40 may be all they're able to tolerate. So again, a, a similar table here looking at um, the outcomes with valbenazine, and I'll just kind of make a couple points here. Um, so again, this first study here was a titration study, 
um, somewhere between 25 and 75 milligrams. The average dose was, I think, 70 milligrams, so um, pretty close to being reflective of this 80 milligram arm. We had a number needed to treat of four. Again, this was a 50% response um, compared to the 30 with ginkgo. Um, this was a six-week study initially compared to the 12 weeks with dutetrabenazine. Um, we can see here basically with the different doses, the 40 milligrams was the number needed to treat of seven. Um, but if you're able to get the higher doses, you're looking somewhere between a number needed to treat of four to five. Um, somewhat similar responses in terms of uh, clinicians, global impressions for, for TD. Um, if you pull the results, number needed to treat of five, uh, that was nine for dutetrabenazine. Um, patient global impression scale, um, didn't have the data for a lot of the other ones, but it was 57.8%, um, which was relatively high. Never needed to treat a four. Um, and again, we're looking at a little higher numbers overall, even though this is just one study. Um, for the dutetrabenazine, more patients felt like they benefited from the valbenazine compared to dutetrabenazine. Um, and relatively similar safety profile, well tolerated. Again, you have um, an overall number needed harm of 76. So really, for every 76 patients, we'll have one that has harm to valbenazine versus being on placebo. So the dosing for valbenazine, um, a little more straightforward. We only have a 40 to milligram, 80 milligram dose. All patients start off on 40. After one week, if they're tolerating it, titrate up to 80. Like I said before, you can go backwards if needed, if there's some sort of um, tolerability issue. Um, but generally speaking, our target dose is 80. Uh, there are some hepatic adjustments. Um, if they have moderate to severe hepatic impairment, um, we maintain them at 40 milligrams. And it was not studied in um, more severe renal impairment uh, with uh, clotting clearance less than 30. Um, so we don't have any adjustments for mild to moderate but we just avoid in severe because it wasn't studied. Um, this has both 3A4 and 2D6 metabolism. Um, again, two very common pathways for medications. Um, when we're dealing with psychiatric medications, um, especially some of our antidepressants, um, we do have some drug interactions to look forward to or um, some of the mood stabilizers, the old school ones like carbamazepine, uh, Depakote to a lesser extent, phenytoin. Um, Obviously not more so psychiatric, but I digress. Um, we're avoiding the use of um, valbenazine with 3A4 inducers. So inducers just means that we're increasing the speed of the metabolism. So it's just less likely to be effective. Um, you could realistically um, pitch that, you know, maybe if we put them on double the dose, it'd be more effective. Um, but these medications, I think, cost close to about almost 3,000 a month. So doubling it may not be reasonable. Um, and if they're on a 3A4 inhibitor, uh, that's considered strong, we reduce those to 40 milligrams. Um, and then 2D6 more so, just kind of considering it in our overall picture. Uh, it does have QT prolongation, similar to um, do tetrabenazine and tetrabenazine. Side, side effects, also somewhat similar. Um, somnolence, some anticholinergic effects, dry mouth, memory impairment, risk of falls, arthralgia, and um, GI upset as well mainly a diarrhea. Okay, so this is the uh, criteria for use that the VA came up with. So for those who practice at the VA, um, this is useful, it's guidance, um, but it's also good for widespread practice because it kind of points out, summarizes some of the safety concerns with it um, and what would be a relatively strong practice to go through. So essentially for all the VMAT2 inhibitors, the VA, despite the evidence saying that we don't have suicidality with the treatment of these agents in tardive dyskinesia, if they've been suicidal within two weeks, it's an exclusion criteria. Is it reasonable? I personally think it is. Um, unless they're suicidal because of their tardive dyskinesia, right? Um, with that being said, we're talking about the risk of someone killing themselves and we're still messing with dopamine. We all know how important that is in psychiatric stability. And if we're gonna mess with that while they're suicidal, we can put this on hold until we're able to kind of resolve the acute issue. Um, but again, some will disagree. Um, congenital uh, long QT interval, looking at interval for 450 greater in men or 470 in women, or being on any other medication that's known to have a pretty significant impact on QTC. Um, looking at drug interactions with monoamine oxidase inhibitors, 
Um, nobody's using reserpine anymore. Obviously can't use the VMAT2 inhibitors together. Um, if they have a history of neuro, uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, um, current clinically significant hyperprolactinemia, um, again, because blocking dopamine can worsen that. And then um, if they're pregnant or breastfeeding, wasn't well, studied in those patients. For tetrabenazine and dutetrabenazine, we're more worried about hepatic impairment, valbenazine, more so renal function. We just don't have the data to back it up at creatinine clearance is less than 30. Um, inclusion criteria, basically a solid diagnosis of tardive dyskinesia. So again, using the score cane criteria, making sure they've been on a dopamine blocking agent for at least three months and differentiating between some of the more uh, common diseases like Parkinsonism and, and whatnot. Um, making sure we get aims at baseline and then following up with repeated measures to see if it's actually working for the patient. Um, and that's pretty much it. I will leave it open to, here's my references, and leave it open to questions. Thank you, Dr. Lavasia. It was very informative. Uh, do we have any questions? All right. I have an observation first. That, uh, the increasing use of antipsychotics in people who aren't psychotic, they're adjunctive to depression. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Sorry. In the use of antipsychotics as adjunctive to de uh, depression treatments, um, you had mentioned uh, people sometimes don't know they have TD. Right. I come ac across these when they've been arrested for DUI because they failed the so a field sobriety test. Interesting. Okay. Um, and when you watch the video of them failing, uh, they are revealing things in their, in their movements that they don't in everyday life. So you might want to do a field sobriety test. Interesting. Um, my other point was a question, really, on your Ginkgo slide. Uh, that, if yeah. you could pull that up. Sure the thing. effectiveness with a really low P seemed to be comparing groups that had absolutely enormous standard deviations. And I don't see that those, those results could be normally distributed. And I wonder if actually what you're seeing in that efficacy is that there are responders and non-responders, and they're just being mixed together. And that, that's certainly fair. Um, I, I think that's uh, certainly a valid hypothesis. And can everyone hear me? OK. Um, the statistics don't make sense, really, when you look at the p-value and the. Yeah, and I, I think that, honestly, um, that's part of the reason why it's has a lower grade of evidence per se um, and, and from that standpoint and again the, the way ginkgo works um, it's primarily thought to work as an antioxidant um, and so my, my is that 